We take a look back at our favorite and least favorite cars of 2015. We also look at an alternative to Volkswagen's diesel next on Talking Cars. Hi there, and welcome to Talking Cars with Consumer Reports. I'm Tom Mutchler. I'm Gabe Shenhar. And I'm Jake Fisher. What's the end of 2015? It's time for us to take a look back over the year. We're going to take a look at the test cars that we've liked the most and the ones that really didn't float our boat that much. But you cannot talk about 2015 without mentioning the biggest automotive story of the year, and that's Volkswagen, the company having admitted to cheating on emissions testing for their TDI diesels. Now, as we record this, the EPA and Volkswagen are figuring out what the fix will be for this. But we have another angle of the story, don't we, Jake? Absolutely. So there's a couple of things. Do you really want to buy a Volkswagen these days? But also, do you really want to buy a diesel these days? So the real question with Volkswagen now is what does this mean for not just about Volkswagen, but about diesel, small displacement diesels in cars for fuel economy, yeah. okay? Um, in terms of big trucks, yeah, we're going to see big trucks having diesels for quite a while. Right, big trucks, it makes sense because you can use the torque. It's nice for towing. That, there, it right. makes sense. So in terms of diesels um, and small displacement, I mean, most other car companies, have, they've gone to hybrids. They've gone to CVT transmissions. They've gone to direct injection, small displacement turbos, and all these other technologies to try to get the good fuel economy, not diesels. Mm -hmm. Because diesel brings in a whole lot of thing, including it's really hard to get those emissions, right. as Volkswagen has excruciatingly loudly yeah. <laughs> showed that to mm -hmm. all of us. Right. So, Behind us is actually the most interesting case because we have the Volkswagen 2-liter diesel um, facing Volkswagen's own 1.4-liter turbo. Mm -hmm. And we just finished testing this vehicle. And it seems that the best reason not to buy a diesel, Volkswagen just gave us. Right. And it's this engine, this is a powertrain. So when we really compare these two engines and the performance, there's really no reason to buy a diesel anymore. And, and you know what, I mean, think back in 2009 when they came out with those diesels. What did Volkswagen have for a gas engine? They had that... Oh, good grief, they had... Was, very uncompetitive that, engine, uh, 2.5 liter, liter five-cylinder, right. which was really rough and, and thirsty. And yeah, they never had a competitive four-cylinder engine. Right, I mean, this generation of the Jetta, which came out in 2011, it's had, it's had more engines than Spinal Tap has had drummers. Right. I mean, you know, it had that 2.5 liter five-cylinder. They were still selling with the two liter four-cylinder that dated back to, I think, almost the late 90s. You know, the 1.4 becoming the base engine for the Jetta actually finally gave the Jetta a competitive gas engine in the base model. Right, and in addition to what Jake just said, you know, Volkswagen was kind of got caught off guard with Toyota's hybrids and the Prius, so they said, oh, we have this diesel, we'll market it as clean diesel, you mm -hmm. know? And, uh, and that, uh, I mean, you have to remember, I mean, Volkswagen, Toyota, I mean, these are two giants on the world stage. So it's, it's a high stake game here. So, so, diesel, so diesel for Volkswagen made sense when you had that 2.5 liter kind of bone anchor of uh, engine. Sure. It was an, it was, it's a non-competitive engine mm -hmm. compared to the best out there. Now it appears they have a very competitive engine with this 1.4 turbo. It's fuel efficient, it's refined, it's powerful, yep. it's quicker than the diesel. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get quite the fuel economy of the diesel, but if you could count for the additional cost of diesel, it's basically parity in terms of in terms of emissions. It actually puts out less carbon dioxide than the diesel because mm -hmm. you know uh, the, the diesels actually put out more carbon dioxide per gallon. Yeah. Um, it, there's no reason to buy the diesel anymore. Plus, it's thousands cheaper. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, there are more levels. I mean, it doesn't have the diesel clatter. It uh, responds right. better. I mm -hmm. mean, the, you, usually you talk about the torque of the diesel. Mm -hmm. Not so much here. I mean, that 1.4 yeah, turbo is so effortless, so yeah. smooth, so nice, so pleasant, uh, yeah. and uh, there's, it completely undermines the case for the diesel. Yeah, we yeah. have not been really impressed about the drivability of this latest two-liter TDI diesel. Um, you know, typically diesels, you know, they have great mid-range torque. They're wonderful for passing on the highway, but it feels lethargic around town, and passing on the highway is no great shakes. Right. So that doesn't follow the diesel stereotype. Now, on the other hand, you have small displacement gasoline turbocharged engines. And in the past, we've said, wow, you know, sometimes these things are unrefined. Sometimes these things just have no response. And, and sometimes they don't get the real world fuel economy that they're supposed to. Right. But Volkswagen pulled it off here. Yeah, sure. um, you know, that is a pretty refined engine. You mm -hmm. put three, three adults in the car and it still goes. It has nice mid-range torque. It is mm -hmm. more refined. Uh, and it's putting up the numbers. 
Um, we got 32 miles per gallon overall out of the 1.4 liter gasoline engine compared to 37 with the diesel. And that's before the fix, whatever that fix to the diesel is going to be, that's right. likely is going to even reduce that mm -hmm. gap further. Yeah, it's very likely that it could. Um, it could change acceleration, it could change mm -hmm. uh, emission, I mean, I'm sorry, it could change fuel economy. Um, I mean, highway still goes to the diesel, you know, with 53 miles per gallon, but that gets 47. I'm not going to complain about 47 miles per gallon on the highway. <laughs> Absolutely not. And, and when you look at the cost of fuel, uh, and diesel being more, it's, again, you're basically a parity. You're at a parity. I mean, 47 miles per gallon is phenomenal. That extra six miles per gallon, it really doesn't account for much. Right. Also, um, like you said, there's <clears> the price difference. Um, when you, they make comparing trim levels tricky, but with parity, it's 28. 2850 more for the diesel. Right. And that's a <clears> lot <throat> of money. Now, it used to be you could say, hey, the TDI Volkswagens have great resale. Well, we don't know what's going to happen there. But, but, but the other thing is, you know, we've done calculations ourselves and we're saying, well, does diesel pay off? You mm -hmm. know? And again, back when we were comparing the diesel to a 2.5 liter, we're like, yeah, it pays for itself considering right. resale. Now, those calculations are out the window with the 1.4T and again, the resale value of diesel. So, whatever's going to happen there. Exactly. So what you've had happen here is gasoline engines have gotten more and more efficient. Because, I mean, mm -hmm. this is not the only car. This is not the only car that size that gets 32 miles per gallon. You can get that from a Mazda, Mazda 3, 3, get it from a Mazda Roller. 6. Well, and, and, and holding up from Mazda 6, I mean, we saw the same thing happen before. So, so Mazda was touting a diesel. They were going to put yeah. a diesel in the Mazda mm -hmm. 6. They were showing it at auto shows for years. Oh, it's going to come out. But again, I think they... They did so well with their Skyactive technology, getting 32 miles per gallon of a Mazda 6, it made no sense to bring a diesel. And they were also trying to make the emission standards without having a urea injection system and right. you know, without having to add diesel emissions fluid, and it, they it, just it, couldn't pull it off. And you know, no they were one, amazed Volkswagen could, and it turned out Volkswagen. Now we know how. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, <laughs> know exactly. how Volkswagen <laughs> pulled it off. So, I mean, it just shows that gasoline engines you know, there's still life in them. You know, they can... They continue to improve. Right. They, absolutely. I mean, you go back 10 years, I mean, it was common to get, you know, 24 miles per gallon in our testing overall of a four-cylinder. Mm -hmm. I mean, now, you know, yeah, competitive you, ones are getting 30 or more. They're in the 30s. Yep. And in the mid-sized sedan. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, uh, yeah, it's very impressive. It makes yeah. the case for diesel much, much less strong. So, Let's review 2015, shall we? Shall um, we? It's the, been the non Volkswagen part. The non Volkswagen part of 2015. Uh, there's been some, we've tested some really nice cars over the last year, haven't we? Oh, yes, we have. Yeah. So, what are some of your favorites, Gabe? Well, for a change, let me put my, uh, <clears throat> my money where my mouth is. So, every time, uh, you know, there's a, like a, an airport car or something that you need to be in, the I gravitate you're... towards the uh, Audi Q3. I mean, I really like that car, mm. and I've, I've found myself gravitating towards the Ford Edge. Mm -hmm. That's I really enjoy that car. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> what makes you like the Q3 and the Edge? Uh, well, the Q3. I, I mean, it's a, it's nice. The side is very handy, very convenient, very maneuverable. I mean, great seats, great. Uh, I like the infotainment system. I like the uh, the handling. Uh, great seat. It's um, one of the more rewarding yeah, it is. sub compact luxury SUVs. Yeah, I don't know if it qualifies as subcompact, but yeah, it's an entry-level uh, crossover. Well, I mean, that, it's there with the X1. That's, and, uh, yeah. you know, um, it's GLM. very satisfying. I mean, it's a lot quieter and a lot, uh, rides a lot better than many uh, non-luxury uh, small SUVs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, I really like it. And the Ford Edge. The Ford Edge. Um, uh, great handling, uh, great ride, very quiet. Uh, it feels very solid, very sophisticated, uh, great seats. Yeah, the <coughs> Edge is quite a transformation story, isn't it? Yeah, the absolutely. 2015 redesign. Yeah, it drives, it drives so nice. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's basically a, it's a, it feels more like a European luxury SUV than it does anything related to what it was before. Right. Um, it really feels very developed. Mm -hmm. Because of the previous Edge, I mean, it always had a ton of power, but it was kind of crude. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it never handled that well. The ride was okay, but nothing special. Right. But now it, it definitely feels like it's a class above. Sure. Any other cars that impressed you? Yes. Sure. <coughs> I get one more. And that's the, uh, the Mercedes AMG, the <coughs> C63 that uh, we just posted the first drive on it uh, yesterday. On a man of uh, modest uh, taste. Yeah. And that, uh, that car is so rewarding. I mean, it's, it's kind of like a merging of an, a true American muscle car with a uh, sophisticated European handling 
uh, machine, and mm -hmm. uh, it just I can't get enough of driving that car. Right now, we've talked about in the past how with performance sedans, you typically like cars in that class. You like 3 Series, you like C, uh, BMW 3 Series, you like Mercedes-Benz C-Class size cars. Yeah, I so. think that size lends itself more for a true super sedan that you can uh, really have some fun on the track with. Right, right. And yet, you know, it, it just uh, delivers uh, this incognito kind of thing. It's very stealthy, so nobody knows <coughs> if you're really driving a fast flashy car. Yeah. Your thoughts on them? You yeah. like it too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, you know, my top three, the, the C63 is right there too. Mm. I mean, that is just an amazing car. Um, you know, what, what's really, I mean, to me, I, I love the old C63 so much with that, the, the big yeah. all displacement engine, but it's like, this is the first one where it's like, yeah, it's turbocharged, yeah, it's downsized a bit, but it sounds ridiculous. It mm. just sounds so good. Yeah, you talked about that, that it doesn't feel like you're giving up anything even though you're giving up displacement. The one thing we gave up is we didn't test it, so we didn't buy that. We're not using any right. donated money for tickets or reports right. to... I, I should have said that in the video. I totally regretted it because I was like, oh, you spent all this money. No, we didn't. We, we paid for the use of right. those vehicles. Um, but it's like a rental. It's yeah. like a rental, but yeah, yeah phenomenal car. Mm -hmm. What else did you like from the last year? The other cars that I liked, well, one bigger one and one smaller one. Um, the, uh, the P85D, mm. you know, the Tesla, Tesla Model S P85D was, is, is still pretty amazing when you get mm -hmm. into it. Um, you know, that amazing acceleration, the, the quietness, the room. Um, I mean, I would probably drive it home a lot more if there wasn't so many new cars that, <laughs> that we need to get into. And if I had a charging station in my home, um, would certainly help, but it is a and still if one of our car. cameramen wasn't taking it home all the time. Looking at you. Yeah, we're, we're looking. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and then the other car that just I continue to love is the Mazda Miata. Mm. Um, I mean, look, it, I, remember when we, did, we tested motorcycles a while back? I mean, the one I liked the best, I mean, it, so I've driven motorcycles. I was kind of a late comer into getting the motorcycles. I love the Ninja 250 yeah. because it's like one of these things where you could just like rev it like crazy and not get into trouble. You're not going super fast, Didn't but it feels like power. it doesn't have enough power yeah. to get into too much trouble. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Miata is. And the Miata continues to be the extension of your fingertips you know it's yeah. like you just everything is natural the shifter is just precise and you can just play with the car and not you know again you get take 63 c63 i mean if i had owned that car i would be in jail i mean <laughs> i don't understand how you could control yourself with this ridiculous amount of power and performance the miata is just playful and just a joy your thoughts on the miata yeah i like the miata too um it's uh like Jake said, it's an extension of yourself. I mean, you feel like one, this oneness with the machine, yeah. with the mm -hmm. car, with the road, and uh, I mean, it's, things are so predictable and, and yet playful uh, with the Miata. Uh, but um, it's it's very limited in appeal. But uh, it always me. has yeah, been. I mean, it's, it's, it's not kind of like, like a toy for a, you know a nice day. But if I uh, have to commute in it every day, I'd. Uh, Probably not be in jail, but uh, I'd be in traction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, as, as you know, the, I've said many times the Mazda Miata is my favorite car of all time, and this one doesn't do anything to break that streak. Uh, I really like, I really like this, this, uh, this generation. Uh, they didn't screw it up, you know, which was a big, sure. big mm -hmm. risk. I mean, the car's mm -hmm. actually smaller. The car is lighter. lighter. Yeah. It has less power, but it's as quick. It gets mm -hmm. terrific. Quicker. Gets, going back to fuel economy, it gets amazing fuel sure. economy mm -hmm. for a sports car. And it looks great, too. It looks it's great. Um, doesn't hurt. Again, I hate to say it, though, but I mean, I wind up with the same issue that, that Jake talked about in the earlier podcast we did on it, that when you can go and buy sure. a, a 2009, 2010 um, Miata Grand Touring for, say, $17,000, right. half the price, right. you know, and, and like you said, because these cars aren't used as daily drivers, there's plenty of them out there with... 15, 20, 30,000 miles. With a whole lot it. of life left. They're very reliable. They're very reliable. That just, um, I'm not going to hold that against the car. The new, sure. Miata, the new Miata is still terrific. Uh, also on my list, it's been a good year for SUVs. It's been a, it seems like every year now is a good year for SUVs. <laughs> it's just what people buy. Uh, the Kia Sorento. Mm -hmm. Every time I get in that car, I'm like, mm -hmm. this is what I'd buy over a um, Highland, a Toyota Highlander, or a Honda Pilot. It's just, it feels upscale. It's really nice to drive. It's a very handy size. You know, it's sort of almost a seven-eighth scale 
Uh, I don't need a third row seat. The, the second row seat's plenty roomy. Yeah, I totally agree with you. It's um, a very nice car. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are, you can argue that um, it doesn't have the reputation of Honda, it doesn't have the reputation of Toyota, but the reputation of Honda is a bit rocky right now. <laughs> sure. And, um, you know, Kia actually, it's constantly getting better. It's one of the more reliable SUVs you can buy. Yep. So, a car that probably won't be one of the more reliable SUVs you can buy, but still impressed me a lot is the Volvo XC90. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Volvo, I'm a big Volvo fan over the years. I've owned a bunch of them. And there was a period of time there where it was just, they were just marking time. But this car is just totally clean sheet, totally mm -hmm. so appealing. I mean, it never sits in our parking lot. That thing is always out on the road. You know, it's a, it feels like a Range Rover for, what, twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 less. And that's really impressive. Yeah, I mean, it looks good, uh, both inside and out. And, uh, but I have to admit, uh, the more I drive it, uh, the less I like it. Mm. Uh, and that's uh, mostly due to the ride, which is way too stiff for a $57,000 car. Mm -hmm. And uh, the infotainment system, I mean, it looks great and very slick looking when you just look at it, it looks like an iPad. But working it uh, while you're driving is a nightmare. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot going on there. It's a car that has a credible showroom appeal. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be very interesting to see when we have reliability data on it, how it's going to be a hold up. Yeah, I say that it probably won't be reliable yeah. because it's so <clears throat> new. Everything is new. Everything is new. new yeah. When you do that. Um, sure. But I, I, I agree. It's very impressive when you get into it. It's like, wow, mm -hmm. they're taking stuff seriously now. Yep. Uh, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to have a fourth car. Oh, a bonus, end of the year bonus. Yeah, because I host this, so I'm gonna. You're, you're running the game, so you can change the right. rules, that's fine. <laughs> that's, that's exactly. Uh, I had a motorcycle, so. All right, cool. <laughs> um, the car that I would always gravitate towards when I needed a car to take to the airport, or you know, something that I was gonna spend a couple of days with and I needed a car that wasn't in the current test fleet is the Mercedes-Benz C300. Mm. That car just, I'd rather have it than a, than a 3 Series, than a BMW 3 Series, and I, have very seldom thought that I would want a Mercedes-Benz over a BMW. I'm not going to hate you for it. I, thank you, Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> That's very much in the holiday season. Thank you for your generosity. Right. No, you know, it was always BMW was the more sporting car, Mercedes-Benz, where it's quiet and soft. And no, nah, this, this, this C-Class has better steering than the 3 Series. I mean, they've updated the 3 Series for nice 2016. Car, yeah. It's a really nice car. And worse reliability than the 3 Series. So as long as you don't get broken down while you're out with it, you're yeah, good. I, I agree with you. It's a, it's a great car. It's not that reliable. But they have to work on that. They really do need to improve reliability. Um, speaking of uh, bad things about cars, what are some of the cars from last year you really didn't like? Okay. So, uh, you know, the uh, freshening for the Acura ILX, you know, wow. that uh, there was great uh, fanfare around that. And uh, I mean, that freshening, I think, that just took a mediocre car and made it a really much more annoying car. <laughs> <laughs> That's I mean, not the way uh, these things are supposed to work. I mean, they, they ruined the ride. They uh, ruined the, uh, they gave it this infotainment system, which is so frustrating. Mm. The car is so noisy and so low, and, they, uh, and, and it's just that chutzpah of uh, charging, you know, $31,000 for this car and, and, uh, and trying to cheat people to think that this is an entry-level luxury car, yeah. and it's so not. The problem that um, the problem that, that car poses is that it's uh, hanging around the office here. We also have a, uh, a 2016 Focus Titanium that was $24,000. Mm -hmm. That Focus is more of a luxury car. Oh, it wipes the floor ILX. without ILX. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah absolutely. I mean, and, and, and just to cut to the chase, the ILX was on my list too. Um, and we didn't talk about this beforehand. I mean, it's just, it's almost just, you know, not giving buyers any credit. You know, it's like, it's like, It's contempt for the buyer. It is. It's like, we'll put a luxury badge on it. And, you know, the CLA, the Mercedes Benz CLA is the kind of the same animal. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, eh, you know what? It's got a Mercedes Benz. It looks nice, but it, there's no substance to it. Right. And, and yes, you look at the Focus has substance. You look at, um, you know, other cars that really do feel substantial. Um, just putting a luxury badge on it is on a mediocre car is not. And, 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 and you know, forget about the Focus for a second. I mean, look at the Civic. 
yeah, right? I mean, the Civic the has Civic. the redesigned the Civic, Civic is, you know, it's probably quieter, probably right. It's so better. much better oh, of a car, it, yeah, you know. No so doubt. the ILX now is on the last generation Civic chassis, which was not any great shakes. So, yeah. Yep. Um, what else is on your list of? Dislike? So uh, yeah, the Mitsubishi Outlander. And also, uh, I mean, that freshening uh, was supposed to really fix all the ailments of the uh, original car. I mean, it's a quick freshening, merely two years after the, they launched the car. And uh, it's yeah, almost so like, it's almost like what Honda did with the Civic. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, they, they fixed the ride a little bit and uh, added some noise isolation. But the car is so clumsy. It's so I mean, the handling is just so roly poly. The seats are uncomfortable. It, it's so outdated. I mean, there are things there like, when was the last time you had to take your hands off the wheel to uh, do something with the onboard computer, the trip computer? Uh, there are so many things that are just so annoying in that car. So that's, uh, that's on the list. I mean, you can see the appeal of it. We haven't been played debate club for a while here, so I'm going to bite on this oh, one. Awesome. And, and I'm, I don't love the Mitsubishi Outlander. But you know, taking your hands off the wheel to get to the trip of computer is kind of first that's, world problems. That's the least of its problems. You know, and, it, and, and it's here's the thing about the Outlander. And, Just an and, example. But, but, but the Outlander is not a great car. I'll give you that. But it does give you a lot for the money. I mean, it's not. It what it was like twenty six. Our, no, our, our car was twenty eight thousand dollars. Twenty eight. So it's basically with Before leather. Discounts. So I mean, it, it's the price of a Rav Four or a CRV. It got. It has have three rows of seats. It most likely will be very reliable. So I mean, for someone who doesn't, so those dealers are going to give you thousands right. of dollars off, and they're going to give you low interest financing because that's right. just what Mitsubishi dealers do. Well, that's that's, their, that's that. their trade. Yeah. That's yeah. So I mean, for 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 the price and what it offers, I, I see its its purpose. Um, um, I'm getting lost. And is it my turn yet? <laughs> but I mean, in um, terms of yeah, I think we're close. <laughs> but in terms of I get my, one more. my bad cars, you, we'll go back to you. But I would. <laughs> I have another. I have an SUV mm -hmm. that um, I don't. I don't like, and it's it's not that one. It's the it's the Land Rover um, Discovery Ooh. Sport, and that was almost on my list. Too. <laughs> but that well, I'll one. I'll change my mind. Play debate club. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> tell me why I'm wrong. Cause I'm looking forward to it. No, but um, but that car is something that Coke sells for a high price, and and, it, and I could almost just copy what you said about the ILX, right? I mean, it's a a luxury vehicle. It's contempt for the buyer. It is. And, and again, going back to your Ford Edge, the Ford Edge is so much more of a vehicle than that Land Rover Discovery Sport mm -hmm. is. I mean, the it's, Ford Escape is more The vehicle. Ford Escape is. So it's, it, it looks kind of cool, but just the way it drives is just... So you can drive it across Iceland like they did on the media <laughs> tour. I mean, Iceland. I, I, you got a point there. But um, I ca quit, I really cashing don't. in on the name. And the discovery. Like, well, that's what it, it is. It looks and that's good. what it is. It's and another thing it, that it's, looks It's like good. the Mercedes-Benz CLA. It's just like the CLA. It, it's just like that. And it's, it's just too bad that, you know, when you see just mainstream players building these terrific cars, um, like, like a Ford Edge, why? Why well, I mean, is that? I there? mean, you also, to be fair, you also have Land Rover, who has, you know, for years had pretty mediocre, their whole lineup has been pretty mediocre products. I mean, a Range Rover Sport now is a really nice car. A Range, Range Rover now is a really, really nice Rover. car. It is. They have the capability to build something right, decent, right, and right. They're, they're pushing this out the door. Exactly. So you have a third? Yes, and uh, you know, usually I kind of like most Italian things, and the Fiat 500X is oh. not one of them. <laughs> uh, I mean, you look at this car, and you just want to love it, you know? And, um, and there are some, some nice details about it, but the car is so frustrating. I mean, the the ride is is harsh. The idle vibration. The it's, yeah. it's plagued with that nine-speed automatic yeah. transmission. It's not a happy car. No, I don't understand why Fiat's here in America. There, I'll say it. Uh, I just don't. I mean, obviously, it's because they own Chrysler now. Yeah. Between corporate pride and leveraging international investments, it makes sense. But man, I mean, <clears throat> the 500X is not going to win the world. Uh, the 500L is loathsome. The L stands for loathsome. Um, yeah, could be worse. It, it could be. Oh, yeah. Just not a, not a competitive car. Mm -hmm. And a lot of money for what, what you get. Um, so you've already had the ILX. Mm -hmm. You've already had... Disco Sport. Yeah. Disco Sport. What's your third? As much as I want to debate these things, the 500X. 
Wow. You know? and, and, now, we did not plan it. No, we didn't. And, and you know, and it's just really sad. I mean, I remember when Fiat, oh, Fiat's coming back to America, and everyone's like, well, don't Fiat make really unreliable vehicles? And I'm like, that was the 80s. Fiat hasn't been Certainly in this domestic. Certainly Chrysler reliability. They're completely different. And, and I, I said, I mean, we should give them a chance. Well, mm -hmm. we, they have a chance. And we have reliability data. And, and they're the hard. worst. Yeah. They are the worst of any vehicle you get on in the American market right now. And, and that's just so so sad. I mean, when you leave a market with a reputation for unreliable vehicles and then come back years later. And you're still unreliable. <laughs> right. It's like, how are you going to exist? And now then they're making these specialty niche types of vehicles. And it's just like, it well, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We'll see if uh, the 124 Spider winds up being like a Sterling, <laughs> taking a, a completely reliable Miata. Yeah, oh, wow. That's a reach back. It, I'm sorry, I mean, yeah, you got to work hard to make a Miata unreliable, but. But we'll see. Oh, we have faith that <laughs> I, well, they are putting a Fiat engine in it. They're putting that 1.4 liter the one turbo in it. Yeah. They also redid the whole suspension. Yeah. Are they going to get a nine-speed auto in there? Oh, or something? <laughs> no, I hope no, not. no, 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 no. Um, so, like you said, we didn't plan in advance. I also had the Fiat 500X on my list. Ooh, um, three X's. I, I was a little more. <laughs> I was a little more general with my Acura hatred, in which I had every sedan built by Acura, <laughs> uh, because the TLX is really not great. Uh, We've we've tried out recently a um, an updated Accord uh, EXL V6. I would much rather take that Accord any day of the week over the TLX. Um, the TLX has been really unreliable because of both the eight-speed and the nine-speed um, transmissions. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's what you bought a Japanese. That's what you bought Acura or Infiniti for. <laughs> you didn't buy the no. C-Class Mercedes right. for that, so it's okay. No, that's I'm right. Just, I knew going I'm in. I'm paying attention. I knew going <laughs> in that the C-Class Mercedes is going to be a problem. Uh, but Acura used to have... That was a surprise, yes. yes it, it, it's kind of a surprise. Mm -hmm. um, my third car that I really didn't like is the Nissan Maxima. Oh, I mean, my parents had a Maxima from one of the oh. years. You know, the, the 1992 four-door sports car, yeah. the, you know, the, the 24 valve. It's sad the, what they've done to the name. Yeah, right? it's just become this concept car styling. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, they've milked that Apple slogan on. to death. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's completely meaningless. Yeah. yeah, it's just uh, it's not sporty. It's n you know there's some nice touches in the interior. Neither but is it luxurious. Cramped. No, it's just it just kind of um, yeah. kind of falls apart when you drive it. So that's going to wrap it up for this year. We wish you a happy new year. As always, we thank you for watching Talking Cars with Consumer Reports. We'll see you next time.